There has to be some common sense. Yes, sir, they have the car stopped in town at the ranch by the We still don't know who pulled the trigger. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. I'm your host, retired NYPD Sergeant Bill Cannon, a 27-year veteran of the NYPD. Guys, for the first time, actually, um, documented evidence is coming out from the prosecution. And, of course, the defense has been asking for this all along, but the prosecution has been using some strategic, uh, you know, strategic information and strategy in in order to present the very best case they can. And what we know is a DNA from a cheek swab directly links Brian Koberger to the knife sheath that left at the Idaho murders. And that's right from the prosecutors. Uh, It was left at the scene of the quadruple, according to a new court filing. So it's, it's on paper in the court filing. The Idaho State Police Lab located DNA on the K-Bar knife sheath that was found on a bed next to the bodies of 21-year-old friends, Madison Mogan and Kaylee Gonzalez. Leita County prosecutors say this. The sheath was face down and partially under both Madison's body and the comforter on the bed. The latest filing noted that. Initial attempts to match the DNA using genetic ancestry data pointed law enforcement toward Koberger, but did not provide law enforcement with substantive evidence of guilt. In West Parents' house in Pennsylvania, where he was staying when he was, ar- when he was arrested, that comparison indicated the DNA found on the trash belonged to the biological father of the individual who left the DNA on the K-Bar knife sheath. Law enforcement then collected DNA from the defendant via a buckle swab, which is the inside of your cheek. They would swab it with a Q-tip and uh, They would process it that way. The comparison showed a statistical match. Specifically, the DNA profile is at least 5.37 octillion times more likely to be seen if the defendant is the source than if an unrelated individual randomly selected from the general population is the source. An octillion is a number followed by 27 zeros. So you can see the probability of that. Prosecutors said in their motion that they do not intend to enter the less specific genetic ancestry data into evidence at the trial. Instead, the state has relied on and will continue to rely on the DNA analysis comparing defendant's DNA to the DNA on the K-Bar knife sheath to establish the defendant's guilt. Koberger has been indicted on four counts of first-degree murder and the stabbing deaths of Madison Mogan, Kaylee Gonsalves, Zaina Canodal and Ethan Chapin. He also faces a, a, a burglary charge in, in, in addition to this. So, folks, this is the first time that the prosecution is documenting this. It's coming out. So no more rumors. This is this is what they have, and they're saying what they have. As a guest with me tonight, uh, we have an outstanding guest, is retired NYPD first grade detective, a bit of a celebrity, uh, Detective Michael O'Keefe. He's he's an author. He's written at least three novels. There's his first one, Burnt to a Crisp on the Scene, A Reckoning in Brooklyn, and also Shot to Pieces. Without further ado, I'd like to invite invite and welcome to the show, Detective Michael O'Keefe. How are you doing, Mike? I'm doing well, Bill. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great uh, to have you on the scene. I, I know a detective with your experience, you, you certainly have a lot of comments and a lot to bring forth in this case. They, you know, as you know, you've been to a lot of trials, a lot of homicide trials. It's a chess match between the prosecution and the defense. And in this case, the stakes are so high because this is a case of a quadruple murder that his not just gotten national attention, but international attention. Your thoughts? I like the metaphor of a chess match. However, I prefer to liken it to cards. 
you don't show all your cards. Not till all the money's on the table and it's time to turn them over. This is one whole card that the prosecution is showing. Because I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the defense filed a motion and they wanted to contest the probable cause. So I believe the prosecution is showing the very minimum of probable cause that caused them to arrest Brian Kohlberger. So it's... I'm sorry, Mike. Go ahead. This is what's come out that they have DNA-wise. It's probably a very tiny little bit of evidence that that, that is going to go into the overall prosecution. You know, as CeCe Moore, who I'll play a clip of her later, she is the um, probably the top uh, investigative genetic genealogist in the nation. And she months ago gave an explicit uh, interview with CNN on how uh, genetic uh, genealogy is used in these cases. And I'll play it later. But one of the things she says is that a hit based on genetic genealogy should never be the sole basis of probable cause or an arrest in a case. You should never build your case. It should just be one of many things mm -hmm. that perhaps prove probable cause and are used to build the case. But it should never be used as your only uh, as your only evidence. And that's right from uh, C.C. Moore. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to play a little bit of this video from uh, Court TV um, to see what they have to say on this. Brand new details in the Idaho college student murders. Accused killer Brian Koberger is a statistical match to DNA recovered from the knife sheath found at the crime scene. Now, that is according to some newly released court documents. A protective order was filed last week that expands on the initial probable cause affidavit. Now, we already knew that Koberger's father was linked to the knife sheath. The FBI further compared DNA from the sheath to a cheek swab of the defendant and confirmed that it was a match. Now, these revelations come from a protective order filed by the state seeking to protect the identities of Brian Koberger's extended family. Many have said that DNA is what will convict the killer. The Gonsalves family attorney, Shannon Gray, previously spoke to Court TV about the importance of the knife sheath to this case. Take a look. That was a pretty lengthy probable cause affidavit. It's one of the lengthiest ones I've ever seen. Um, uh, but I think they were very, you know, they wanted to provide as much information as they could uh, to establish probable cause. And it, it laid out a little bit of the state's case, how they might proceed on the case at trial. Um, but there's a lot of still other circumstantial evidence that uh, will be gathered between now and the trial date. You know, you still have three other crime scenes. You have his apartment. You have the car. You have uh, his parents' house that all need to be processed for evidence um, of the crime. And then any other evidence that comes in between now and then. Um, but the probable cause, I mean, I, I thought that, you know, it was it was well done. Um, you know, the, I think the biggest piece of evidence that jumps out to you is the DNA evidence on the sheet. I think that's the, that's the, the one piece of evidence that will be hard to explain uh, as a defense attorney on the case. So I think that's the, the biggest piece of evidence. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about this. And I, I have a prop, uh, and I can't underscore enough just how heavy this is. I have a K-Bar knife here. Uh, this is the type of weapon that was used to kill those four beautiful college students. Um, this is the sheath, and it was on this snap of the sheath. This snap right here that was swabbed, and that's where that little bit of a DNA profile began. So that's where it all started. Now, investigators didn't know whose DNA it was on the snap. They just were able to get somebody's DNA here. And as they continued investigating, they honed in on Brian Koberger. That is why investigators started going through the trash at the family home. Mike, let's talk a little bit about how they arrived at probable cause about they went the long way around the world to get this DNA, to get uh, to identify this DNA. You want to talk a little bit about that in the, the, the part three of this, and I hope you can remember the first two things is part three is the protection order that the prosecution filed 
in order to protect their sources. Maybe you'll touch upon that also. Um, yeah, well, first of all, uh, with respect to the roundabout, they were uh, they were up on Brian Kohlberger because of the car. So they kind of knew who they were focusing on because the vehicle kept showing up. And uh, and it was non-DNA sources that, that they identified him as a possible suspect. So now when they come up with the DNA, they have a pretty good idea. This guy doesn't add up. And they see from his behavior when he returns home, they actually see him cleaning out the car wearing gloves. So obviously you want what's in that trash. Um, it seemed very methodical and they, and they seem to be going from step A to step B to t step C. Once they got the familial DNA from the snap, um, and it was most likely from the inside of the snap, probably from skin cells, because that's cable and knives, that particular sheath. That snap is a tough one to open, and only the wearer of the knife can open it. And yet there's no way that you're not going to leave skin cells there. I'm sure once they came up with the, uh, the the DNA, they ran it through all accessible databases, and their subject doesn't show up in any of those. But they still like him, and and by I by like him, I mean they have reasonable suspicion because he really doesn't his DNA, and he doesn't belong in the crime scene, which was a horrific crime scene. Once they got the DNA and identified that uh, from DNA from the trash had to be the parent of the suspect DNA that came off of the knife sheath, all, all the things started to coalesce together. With respect to protecting the family members, uh, the other people in the family tree from the Kohlberger family, um, I'm not sure why they did that, uh, unless they're going to get one one of the family members to testify against. No, Mike, I think the reason they did that was to protect the FBI actually had to build a family tree okay. to see who potentially they have the father's DNA. Now, let's see potentially who could be the owner of this DNA and that when they finally did swab Brian Koberger, they basically got. You know, as close as you could get to a 100% match. We said Quint, whatever it was, octillion. I don't even know that. Uh, 5.37 octillion times to one. Uh, I mean, to break that down, basically, the statistics, it's infinitesimal that it couldn't be him. It's nearly impossible. It had to be him. It's, it's a mathematical equation that there is any leeway with that analysis. It's him. Absolutely. You know, Mike, we have um, another special guest and for all our, our fans and our subscribers and our friends, we have Dr. Debbie Goodman, uh, a, a criminologist from St. Thomas University in, uh, in Northern Miami. Dr. Debbie, welcome to the show. Hello. Good evening, Sergeant Bill, detective and the wonderful viewers. Thank you so much. My, my regrets for the delay. We've had thunderstorms here in South Florida, so Wi-Fi was down, but so happy and honored as always to join you, and uh, thank you so much for the special invitation. Dr. Debbie, uh, we've been talking a little bit about this, and this is sort of like, even though we knew all of this information, this is the first time that really the prosecution is openly and actually putting out the documentation admitting this evidence exists and how they arrived at this evidence. Your comments, Doc. Well, first again, uh, good evening, Sergeant Bill, Detective O'Keefe, our, our wonderful viewers of Police Off the Cuff. I think it's huge. I really do. Um, there's always going to be a tipping point in the case. I think right here, right now, this is it. We know um, that we hold our local, state, and federal officers and agents in high esteem. They know how to do this. They know what to do. Very meticulous with uh, diligence, decorum, demeanor of making sure everything is done properly. So when we look at the science of this, we know in our field that science doesn't lie. DNA doesn't lie. People lie. So if our suspect is asked, is, is he guilty? Is he not guilty? He could say whatever he wants. We know that he stood silent. We interpret that to mean uh, not guilty. 
But now we have his DNA on the knife sheath and it aligns with trash that was taken from the Koberger home. At this point, we are looking at a numerical value that, that many of us, unless we're directly in this field, we just don't even use as commonplace language when we're speaking about octillion. You know, we, we can understand and, and fathom millions, billions, trillions, but now we're talking about a one with 27 zeros. So if we want to calibrate that and what that now equates to in terms of this suspect, I have to say it's a slam dunk. Absolutely. You know, one of the things, Doc, uh, and uh, Mike, to you also directing this, is the techniques they used to arrive at this. And it turns out that they did use the STR technique, which is short, short for short tandem repeats. Uh, and the, the Idaho State Police did the analysis of their direct buckle swab to Brian Koberger. Because, look, they already had, they used the SNPs technology, which I'm learning something new every day, which stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. My God, that's a mouthful, huh? And that is the technology that is used in investigative genetic genealogy. So that's what that tech, that technology, and of course, using those sites and people erroneously say 23andMe. 23andMe doesn't allow law enforcement to use their site. So the, it was some other sites and the prosecution is not letting us know what they used. However, that's what identified Brian Koberger's father's DNA. Now that the police had, and I just want to make this clear, the police had probable cause. They went there and you're under arrest. They took his a buckle swab and directly compared it to the DNA on the knife sheet and boom, they got a hit of, as we said before, that... Uh, 5.37 octillion. That's what this show makes every month. 5.37 <laughs> octillion dollars a month. You know, <laughs> 27 zeros. <laughs> 27 zeros, my God. So a lot of people have questioned that. And also it's questioned of how accurate is single touch DNA? And look, none of us here in regards to DNA are experts. But that is where the arguments are going to come from the single touch DNA. It's not, it could be sweat. It could be this, it could be skin, could be skin fibers, whatever, but it's not blood. It's not semen. It's not saliva. So that is where the argument is going to come from the, the, uh, the defense. Mike, detective Mike. Yeah. It's uh, the, the defense at this point. Uh, the only thing they can, uh, can argue is, uh, to try and and refute the significance of that knife sheath, the only argument, the fact that it was that it was touched by him, is indisputable, mathematically indisputable. You can speak about octillions all you want; it's him. The only thing the defense can do is to make that evidence innocuous, like it, he had a reason to be there with that knife sheath and leave it behind. Well, you know, he left it. At a horrendous murder scene where four people were killed. And there is no reason that I can see or that I've heard. And I'm sure the detectives looked into this. What's his reason, his innocuous reason for being there and leaving such a thing behind? When in fact, now they know it was a K-bar. I'm sure once the medical examiner evidence comes up with respect to the wounds, it's going to match that kind of knife. He's... uh. The defense has no choice but to try and refute the veracity of, of that DNA. Otherwise, it's game over. Absolutely. Dr. Goodman. Yes, sirs. Um, absolutely, Detective Mike. Um, that's really the only thing this defense possibly, logically, reasonably would come up with. But again, we know in our field, these are the irregularities. How How is it? that at a heinous, horrendous crime scene, we have a very compelling uh, piece of evidence. Doesn't matter how big, how small, 
But what matters, I think, most is that this is linking him right then and there. You know, I think this suspect, again, we know uh, innocent until proven guilty, but if we're just looking at the tangible evidence and we can still move into the circumstantial evidence, which I feel as a criminologist is significant, but this knife sheath alone, it is right there as a central item in this horrific crime scene. And I think this suspect just thought he would get away with this and was well-read, well-versed on these killers that preceded him, such as the Jeffrey Dahmers and Ted Bundy and, you know, Dennis Raiders, even though we'll put them in a serial murderer category, but he studied them with, with a lot of detail and interest. And I think that he himself was absolutely shocked and startled when the knock on the door comes and, and he's the guy, he's the suspect. And he couldn't wait, remember, to be extradited and find out how and what possibly could local, state, and federal law enforcement officers have that would link him. I think he thought he um, didn't make one error. And if anything, this defense will now, as we would project them to do, really look at the um, process by which investigators did what they did, hoping to find some kind of mishap or misstep or mistake. But the one who really made the colossal mistake, in my opinion, as a criminologist, is this suspect. Mm -hmm. He made a colossal error, and this is what's going to lead to his processing in our criminal justice system. 100%, Dr. Debbie. You know, five months ago, C.C. Moore, who is the top investigative genetic genealogist in this country, made some comments in regards to this case, which I, as a, you know, look, I'm a lifetime student. I think if you're not a lifetime student, then you're a fool because everyone has to learn their entire life and everyone can learn something new their entire life. And I don't pretend to be an expert in DNA, but I watched this and she explained it to so easily that uh, the layman could understand what she was talking about. Now, now it won't play probably. There we go. <laughs> Well, she talks about touch DNA. Can. Here we go. Okay. On December 27, Pennsylvania law enforcement discovered that trash and sent it to the Idaho State Lab for DNA testing. The very next day, the lab was able to match a DNA profile obtained from the trash as all but assured as being from the biological father to a person whose DNA was found on the knife sheath. As the document states, at least 99.9998% of the male population would be expected to be excluded from the possibility of being the suspect's biological father. Joining me now is C.C. Moore, head of genetic genealogy services for Parabon Nanolabs Law Enforcement Unit, which has made more than 200 successful identifications of violent criminals. She's not worked the Idaho case. She stars in the documentary series, The Genetic Detective, now streaming on ABC, and she is also has worked on all 10 seasons of the PBS television documentary series, Finding Your Roots with Henry Louis Gates Jr. Cece, thank you for being here. What does this mean, single source of male DNA, which I'm reading from the affidavit? It means there were no other DNA detected on that, meaning sometimes you can have a mixture. You can have multiple people's DNA. You want to have single source DNA, if at all possible, because that really just ties that one person to that item. Now, it was likely that this was touch DNA. Certainly it's possible there was blood. They didn't tell us what type of DNA, but most likely it was touch DNA. And that would typically be just a few skin cells. This might've been a very small amount of DNA, but because of today's technological advances, we can detect even the tiniest bit of DNA. How reliable is touch DNA if it is skin cells in comparison to say blood? It's a great question. It is more transferable. So of course you would like to have blood. You would like to have semen or saliva and they might, you know, they haven't shown all their cards. We don't know all that they have, 
But touch DNA, now that we can use it because of the sensitivity of our equipment, it also means you have to be more cautious about using DNA as your only evidence. So it's a really positive thing that they clearly have other evidence. This is just one piece of it. We have seen DNA, touch DNA transfer in other cases. Of course, it's fairly rare, but it is something that you have to be aware of and make sure that there are other aspects of the case also pointing at the same person. Cece, good news, I guess. It's hard to commit murder without leaving something behind. That's right. Yeah, I've been saying this for weeks. That type of violent, intimate crime, it is virtually impossible not to leave something behind, even if you are a criminology PhD student. So I am not at all surprised they were able to find something. Even if he tried hard not to leave something, you still would. And that is great news, because what it means is that anyone who perpetrates this type of crime in the future should be aware that they will be identified, they will be caught. There really is no reason that we should see serial killer, serial rapist moving forward. This guy you know, potentially could have become a Ted Bundy or even a Zodiac, not identified 50 years later. But because of the DNA technology, the advances that we're seeing, both in investigative genetic genealogy and the ability to use tiny amounts of DNA, we can identify someone, whether they are in the law enforcement database or not. Brilliant. This was five months ago. All right. She could be talking today when she learned about this. She predicted all of this. First of all, for all you amateur sleuths out there, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way, he <laughs> definitely left other DNA there. He left, I have no doubt he left blood there. But the prosecution's not telling us. Look, they just let this slide out because they were concerned. Well, first of all, the defense is pushing really hard, as they should. They're his defense attorneys, and they're going to work as hard as they can to create doubt, right? But at the same time, the prosecution, they want to win this case for people who were murdered. Whether or not Brian Koberg, in fact, is guilty of this, that remains to be seen. He's innocent till proven guilty. They certainly have uh, a lot of evidence against him right now. Mike, where are they going? Where is the defense going to go to attack this DNA evidence? Uh, it seems so methodical in the way that they uh, they recovered it. Uh, they would have to probably go after the individual detectives who found it in the first place. As we saw in the O.J. Simpson trial, they attacked the detectives. They never adequately attacked the evidence. They attacked the detectives who collected it. It's a travesty. Uh, but that's what I ex I believe that that's going to be their Hail Mary. I don't think they're going to get over uh, with it. Um, what I'm going to find very interesting when the prosecution goes forward is I, I want to see them discuss motive. They don't have to prove motive for a murder case, but I'm pretty sure in this case that they're going to address it. And what I'm looking at, just based upon the evidence and, and, and what I've heard about this case, uh, this was an ordered personality with a background or at least an amateur's background in this. And he was intrigued by it. If you look at his course of study and what he was pursuing, uh, he thinks he's smarter than everyone else. A uh, bit of a narcissist, just based upon what, what I've heard from statements. Uh, and I shouldn't be drawing conclusions from looking at him, but those eyes are like the eyes of an insect. There's no empathy in there at all. Uh, I believe... And it's just a hunch, a detective's hunch. His motivation for this was he was he was conducting a field experiment in murder because he thought he was clever enough to get away with it. Um, uh, well, you don't get away with something like this. And as you alluded to earlier, you think there's other DNA there. This was a frenzied knife attack. In my experience, 24 years doing what you did, um. Uh, I never saw a knife attack like this. And keep in mind, this is four people that he cut up like this, where the victim didn't cut himself as well. So you, mean the be, you mean the perpetrator, the perpetrator? I'm sorry. Yeah, the perpetrator didn't cut himself as well. So I believe that his blood is will have been collected. 
and isolated and will be presented as evidence later. But that's just a hunch based upon my experience and the nature of this crime. I believe he went into it with an ordered plan to fulfill a fantasy. But there's a, there was a brilliant philosopher from Brooklyn uh, who once said, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. <laughs> once the crime started taking place, it became disordered very quickly to the point where he didn't even realize he left the sheep there. That's how you explain him leaving something there from someone that you would think would be smart enough to take it. Absolutely. That's my take on it. And, and this is well, all speculation. Well, look, your your thoughts are from an educated point of view since you did do 24 years as an NYPD detective. You're a smart guy. Dr. Debbie, some of the same things that Mike was talking about, where is the defense going to go with this? Where are they going to attack the evidence? Are they going to attack? Where's the motive? What motive could he possibly? That's, that's coming too. I think of right now, and of course, the next uh, October 2nd is when this trial is supposed to start, which I fully doubt will occur. I don't think it's going to. There is a court date, I think, on June 29th to discuss. I don't know if it's still the gag order or there's other housekeeping things that the defense is raising. Your thoughts, Dr. Debbie, what are they going to attack? Sure. Well, thank you, Sergeant Bill and Detective Mike, if I could just go back momentarily to CeCe's um, description and approach to all of this, I, I think it's really reasonably stated and, and logically said what she said. Okay, would we prefer to potentially have the suspect's blood, urine, semen? Yes. But then here's the dot, dot, dot. The however is we still have touch from him. It's not from the other 27 zeros that exist in the world, right? It's none of us. It's, it's you know, this is a worldwide case that has just captured um, the attention of for, for so many reasons because of its heinous nature, because of our suspect's background. But, but back to Sergeant Bill, you know, where's the defense going? I, I do agree with Detective Mike. I think that the science of this DNA and the findings, they won't necessarily touch that literally figuratively. Why? Because it's going to be an uphill battle and a, and a losing end result. But I do think the, the approach to this is going to find flaw within the formatting of the collection, the preservation um, of this data, of this evidence. And they will try to find flaw with, with local, state, and federal officers and agents, but I have been following this every day as, as many of us in the field and certainly our, our educated viewers who are keeping up with all that we are. And I don't see any mistake at all on this. Now, I would like to share, even though a motive is not necessary, let's say, for the prosecution, but if they would want to introduce one, I have two, actually. I think his motivation would start with an acronym that, that I created that I think is relevant here, an acronym JAR, J-A-R. I think this suspect was jealous, angry, and seeking revenge. On the jealousy piece, I believe that he wanted to be a part of a socialized, connected group, and he was apart from. I think this is really his entire life and lifestyle where he wanted to be accepted and part of something and someone, whether even to have a male friendship. We don't even know if he had a platonic male friendship with anyone. And we do believe that he did not have any type of female relation, friendship, intimacy up to the age of which, you know, this occurred at age 28. So did he aspire for it? Was he jealous of these four decedents? I think so. And then if we get to the, the A part, if you will, of the acronym, I think he was angry. I just think that when October 2nd and beyond, and, and we're you know seeing daily the trial, if it's to be televised, but we will come to find out that he did try to communicate with two of our female decedents on social media, and it was a one-way conversation. Not that anybody's ever obligated to be reciprocal and with whom they speak, but they didn't speak back or 
you know, communicate back. So I think that angered him. And then ultimately the, the end result of this atrocity is that he sought revenge because he was either slighted or ignored, which is probably what consistently happened in his life of, of 28 years. Now back to something uh, Detective Mike said also, which I would agree with and subscribe to that I think he, of, of his studies of, of the people, of those who had gone before him and seemingly he may have had some type of, you know, favor toward or idolization or looking up to. But I do think that another part of this motivation, what Detective Mike said, I do agree with that it was as if he was to lead and participate in his own case study of criminality, whereby he was the star of the show. He was orchestrating this entire A to Z plan, if you will, of what he would do, selecting his victims. We all know in terms of victimology that this is very specific for these individuals. These killers, whether they're mass murderers, serial murderers, they select those with whom they're going to ultimately have complete degradation and, and control and power. And I think that's what happened here. He thought he would be the star of this case study. He'd get away with it. And then I believe he would become a serial murderer. Absolutely. You know, one of the things in a lot of the, as we all know, this the publicity that this case has gotten is, you know, international in nature, international in scope. And that is why the gag order was slapped on, because so many people, I believe, in social media, specifically some of the YouTube content creators, were actually endangering people that had nothing to do with this case. But all you have to do is point the finger at somebody, and that person is in danger when someone that has 100,000 subscribers says, oh, they should look at this guy. He's he's guilty. He did it. And they, during this case, they've pointed, many people have pointed fingers in many different directions. I want to speak also about a lot of the talking heads, who I call them, uh, that go on all the different channels. And we could call ourselves talking heads, Dr. Debbie. We go on the, we go on the channels too. So that <laughs> disparaging remark, I fit it too. So I guess you could call yourself a name. Anyway, the, the people that are the profilers, and the behavioral analyst, they brought up a term early on in this investigation. And frankly, I hadn't heard it in my 27-year NYPD, 10-year, 16-year Detective Bureau career. And the term was incel. And incel stands, and Mike, I could see you probably don't know what it means either. It stands for involuntarily celibate. Mm -hmm. And that can be, according to a lot of the behavioral analysts, uh, the profilers, where his anger stems from, that he wants one of these beautiful girls mm -hmm. and he can't have one because he's, for whatever reason, he's awkward. He doesn't know how to speak to women. He, he's, he's not a bad looking guy. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not a good judge of that, but <laughs> he's not a, he's not a bad looking man. So that's not a factor, but it has to be something within his personality that's created that for him. Mike, uh, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, with respect to him not being a bad looking man, uh, everything I every video I've seen of him, I have yet to see him sweat or blink. Mm. That's suspicious right there. <laughs> Those eyes that don't blink. There's just something going on. Uh, I would love to sit in a room with this guy and just pick his brain. Because it's Dr. what's going to come out is not the way you and I process information. It's not the way that we understand the world. He's coming from some place that we're. I mean, we understand it being involved in the in, in the criminal uh, investigation field, but I don't think we can get in line with it <laughs> and truly. No, oh, but you know, Mike, I'm talking more from a a, a Sigmund Freud psychosexual point of view. Here's a 28-year-old healthy man whose intelligence going for his PhD, yet he has no female companionship relationships, no sex, and he's involuntarily celibate. Dr. Yeah, Debbie, your frustrated. thoughts? He's yes, frustrated. Man. He's frustrated. And from what we know about him, the only validation he's ever received is in his academic career. And what has he studied but serial murder? How else is he going to... Inflict is the word, his personality on the rest of the world. 
but to take that step and fulfill that fantasy. I'm cleverer than Ted Bundy because I'm not getting caught. Hmm. I think he's just trying to validate himself to himself. Could be. But again, this is just speculation. I'm going on appearance. And what I know of his behavior with respect to establishing the, these victims, that they came to his attention and, and, and how much time he spent on it before the crime. And then I look at the horrendous nature of the crime. It's, you know, it's... Uh, he was trying to achieve something. There was a personal motivation. And I don't know necessarily revenge was enough of a motivator. I think that he had something personal to prove to himself with respect to I'm, I'm, I'm smarter than the police. They'll never catch me. And I personally, as, as a detective, I love those guys. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Debbie, your thoughts on the incel angle here? Yes, sir, Sergeant Bill, Detective Mike. So I will agree with that theory. I, I do think we would um, put that label on him, and I think he fits many of the elements of the criteria. Um, as a 28-year-old male, even to have a female platonic friend, there there is just no name that appears. And if he is a heterosexual male to have a platonic male friend. Now here's what we know, even from the colleagues, and I'm talking about student colleagues with whom he would have interacted in the classroom. And many when asked, well, how would you describe him? Okay, they're using words like odd, strange, thinking he's smarter than everybody and everybody in the room to include the professor. And some of the student commentary of which I've reviewed also points to when a talking point, let's say in the classroom may have come up and it could have been answered in 30 seconds or less. He would go on and on the five minutes to answer just to really have the spotlight. So on that issue, I agree with Detective Mike. I think his real accolade and perhaps singularly so was the academic piece. But I strongly believe that he wanted some type of friendship beyond maybe the intimacy, having a girlfriend. And I think when we get to trial and more revelations are forthcoming, we are going to see this, this reaching out to connect. But again, only on the one side, there was no reciprocity and no, um, you know, recurring communication. And we do believe as well, he may have photographs. Now, again, I understand, as do our viewers and both of you, of course, that we'll, we'll say it's circumstantial. OK, so what? He's got a photograph of one or more of the victims. But I think that is significant, too, because now it shows there was some level of desire. And then it led to the targeting of and the selectivity of our four victims. He may have been jealous of Ethan. Why? Because Ethan has a girlfriend and um I think there's a lot to be said about the incel theory, and I do think it's relevant. Absolutely. And I think that you covered the J-A. I don't know if you covered the R, but uh, absolutely jealousy uh, in, in regards to the incel and anger, of course, at uh, angry at the fact that he has no female or even male relationships. And so he's a jealous and angry individual. The revenge is yet to be seen. That may uh, uh, come true. Uh, let me just go to a quick commercial, guys, and we'll be right back. Folks, this is Police Off the Cuff, real crime stories. If you like real crime, true crime from a police perspective, then you're in the right place. And if you're not subscribed to us, go on our YouTube. Hit that subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up. Ring that bell. Make lots of comments. We love to read your comments. We love to respond to them, as long as you're respectful. We also have a Patreon with three different levels if you want to support us financially. We have a YouTube channel membership with five different levels. And you see the folks in, with the green font. They are part of our YouTube family, friends, and uh, they support police off the cuff, real crime stories. You know, we sort of went off a little bit on what this show was actually supposed to be about, but that's okay. Uh, because basically what, what's been going on uh, of late, of course, is the defense really trying to f flex their muscles in several different ways. And 
in demanding, almost demanding uh, discovery information, discovery evidence be presented by the prosecution. And I've read the Idaho law and all it says about discovery is that it has to be fully submitted before the start of the trial. So it, the, 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 the trial hasn't started. I mean, allegedly it's going to start October 2nd, which I, I, I don't see that happening. So there's going to be numerous other motions, but the defense is trying to do their best, of course, to uh, represent their client, their client Brian Koberger, and in so uh, they're going to be attacking the prosecution and some of the legal moves. And let's not forget that this is a death penalty case, so that everything has to be done correctly by the prosecution and especially by the judge in this case, or it can be left open for appeal. Mike, what do you think? Yeah, I'm, uh, to be honest, I think when they finally get the full discovery, the defense is going to be a little overwhelmed and they're going to ask for an extension because it's going to be so much material that they have to parse through. Um, I don't know that they're going to be able to make a, an adequate defense at all. Uh, they might actually entertain uh, challenging his fitness to stand trial. Hmm. You know, I don't well, there's know. No, Mike, there's no, just so you know, there's no insanity plea in uh, in Idaho. But they might be able to get him out, keep him out of the electric chair by arguing diminished capacity. I mean, at some point, that decision has to go to a jury, correct? Well, I would think that, you know, uh, there's not going to be any plea in this case. Absolutely. It will be, well, they're not going to be... let him plea. The, the crime is too no. heinous. But... If after, let's say, for instance, he's convicted, and he's convicted of all four murders, uh, we're going to go to a penalty phase. And at that point, an argument can be made that he was mentally ill and diminished capacity to the point where he shouldn't he shouldn't be put to death for it. That might be the angle the defense is taking. Because to be honest, when all of this evidence comes out, as, as we anticipate it will, they're not going to have a lot of maneuvering legally unless they disparage the investigators who collected the evidence. I don't I don't see them knocking down any of this. Dr. Debbie, your thoughts? Yes, yeah, Sergeant Bill, and I appreciate what Detective Mike just said. You know, when it comes to discovery, we also know there are different categories of what's to be presented. I think thus far with what we know, meaning what's now been revealed for the public domain, I still think that as far as the tangible evidence, you know, this is the tipping point, this knife sheath with the DNA, and it's in this octillion category. So, so what is the defense going to say? They can't say it's not him. They're going to, again, I believe what Detective Mike said, that they're going to put the attack on the investigators, the investigation. Somehow they'll point to a flaw and, and something irregular and against policy, procedure, protocol. Again, I don't see it happening in terms of its fruition, but I think that's going to be presented. But let's not forget all that is still out there, at least that we know. There's so much that we don't know, of course, that hasn't been revealed yet. It will be, and we'll have further discussion and commentary, as will the viewers in their participation and thoughts. But if we're looking at his car, his car is in the vicinity of this atrocity. We see the phone, his phone being pinged in the vicinity of this tragedy. So all of that, too, gets introduced, and I think that's the beauty of our field. We don't have the weapon. We may never see a weapon. I think this suspect has the weapon. Where is it? We don't know. Could it be literally in such close proximity to him or the Koberger home? I think so. But for me, there is just no way that he discarded this weapon. Why? Because we know. We know data analytics and we know history. And we look at all of the preceding cases that have come before, whether mass murder categories, serial murder categories. These killers, to them, this is the trophy. The trophy is the weapon. So I don't believe we're going to be introduced in discovery 
to this weapon. I just don't think we need it. Um, I may just mildly respectfully disagree with Detective Mike on just one issue, and that is the mental capacity. I think that this prosecution is going to go totally the other way, that this individual has intellectual capacity, that he's well-versed, he's well-read, he has a bachelor's degree, he has a master's degree. He wasn't that far into the PhD program, but I can tell you as a professor, thousands of students with whom I've had the honor and privilege of working, we know that from this educational and training standpoint, there is a deep dive when we start, um, you know, looking at all the cases and, and the facts and the issues and the selectivity of victims and, and the weapons. He would have immersed himself in this study. So I think, if anything, the capacity of this individual is at the higher level of intellectual capacity, which will bode well for the prosecution. And I think he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew what he was doing was wrong. He didn't care. He thinks he's getting away with it. And here he is, the deer in the headlights. He is caught, is my humble opinion. D Dr. You know, Debbie, that... I, don't, I don't disagree with you, and I'm not suggesting there's any credence to the diminished capacity. I'm just saying with this, this small bit of evidence that we're aware of now is overwhelming, as small as it is. And we are of the opinion that there will be a lot more. Yes. What I'm saying is that the defense doesn't have much to hang their hat on, so they got to try and hang it on something. Sure. Maybe I, a I, I, attempt to argue diminished capacity on his behalf, but what else did they have? Nothing, Detective Mike. I, I'm with you, and and I'm so as you know, Sergeant Bill knows about me. I'm I'm so respectful of and appreciative of our our local state and federal law enforcement agents, officers, our men and women who are doing so much for so many. So they will be attacked, unfortunately, on this. I yeah. think that's where, you know, the, the anchor, let's say, of, of this defense is going to be. And, and the good news is, of course, that we'll be able to demonstrate how the investigators led her to the law, A to Z, did everything correctly and in adherence to their policies, procedures, and protocols. And I just think it's going to be this ping pong match where, where the, you know, prosecution will lead it. They'll toss the ball to the other side. What can the other side do? Attempt to toss it back. But I just think at the moment, unless there is just something spectacular that this defense has up their sleeve, I, I can't, you know, see it at the moment. What could possibly be their singular approach to how to defend this individual? You know, someone asked someone asked in the chat, um, do you think that he's somewhat and this this isn't the exact language they used, but they what they inferred was do you think he's taking part in his own defense? And my answer to that is absolutely. absolutely. Anyone that has a defense attorney or has a team of attorneys is taking part in their own defense and making suggestions whether his counsel takes and acts upon his suggestions is another thing uh, mm -hmm. because obviously the council, that's why they're called counsel. They're counseling you, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. However, the defendant will absolutely take part in his defense. We'll know how actively if all of a sudden his lawyers resign. Mm. That, <laughs> yeah, would, well, that would be a good indication <laughs> that he's being very he heavy handed with his defense attorneys, thinking he knows more than they do also. Right. So, which but, you know, Mike, he's got he's got legal aid, so I don't think they you know they can really uh, there's too much of a uh, a big you know bullpen. There's not there's not right. lawyers waiting in the bullpen to show up that are warming up right now. You right. know, so right. uh, I think he's got one of the best legal aid attorneys. Uh, That's what I was there. going to say, Sergeant Bill. I think yeah. Ann Taylor, she's a tremendous um, asset here. And if she's in, then she would be all in. So I would see her really representing her client. Well, whether she agrees or disagrees, she'll fight hard for him. Absolutely. I want to play a little bit of this. This is from uh, law and crime. As the prosecution confirms publicly for the first time that genetic genealogy was used to identify Koberger as a suspect and that the DNA in the case is a statistical match. I'm Anjanette Levy. Thanks for joining us here on Law and Crime. Brian Koberger faces burglary and first degree murder charges for the deaths of Maddie Mogan, Kaylee Gonsalves, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin last November in an off-campus home in Moscow, Idaho. 
We've known since Koberger was charged last year that prosecutors claim DNA found on a knife sheath on Maddie Mogan's bed was 99% likely to have come from a child of Koberger's father. But prosecutors say further DNA testing has revealed the DNA found on the knife sheath is a statistical match to DNA collected from a cheek swab of Brian Koberger. Basically, that's just fancy terminology for they got a DNA hit. And with DNA, it's not just one test, boom, they got it. There's always a confirmatory test, a second confirmatory test that gets done. It's, I think it's more of a procedural thing. James Bogan is a defense attorney who's followed the Idaho 4 case. The revelation about the DNA being a statistical match came in a prosecution motion asking the court for a protective order on the investigative genetic genealogy techniques used by the FBI in this case. The motion is the first time the prosecution has acknowledged publicly and on the record that investigative genetic genealogy was used to find a suspect using DNA found on the K-bar knife sheath, which prosecutors now say was found partially underneath the body of Maddie Mogan and a comforter. James, what do you make of the prosecution seeking a protective order for this investigative genetic genealogy material? The state says in their opening paragraph, they're seeking to protect the names and personal information of, they're saying hundreds of innocent relatives on the family tree and the names of the publicly available genetic genealogy services used and certain um, other information that's described in the motion. It's quite a lengthy motion. Now, I could see wanting to keep innocent parties out of a you know, public record for a criminal case, but obviously, you know, what you're always concerned about as a defense attorney is you want to be able to look at everything that uh, could be relevant to the evidence in the case. Another new wrinkle in the case. Your Honor, we'd ask the court to set this trial at the very outside of the speedy trial, right? We're not prepared to do anything but ask the court to do that today. The defense is asking for a speedy trial set for October of this year, despite receiving mountains of evidence from the state with much more to come. Following that request for a speedy trial, which is Koberger's right, his attorneys now want to stay or delay the proceedings because they can't reach an agreement with prosecutors on what material they will be given from the grand jury proceedings. Grand jury proceedings are secret, with prosecutors presenting evidence to obtain an indictment against a defendant. Prosecutors used a grand jury in Koberger's case. The defense asked for a speedy trial in this case. It's set for October 2nd. Now they're asking to stay the proceedings, saying we can't get the state to agree to give us all the grand jury materials that we want. Uh, so the state is now saying they oppose the motion for a stay. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? That's pretty. You know, th this whole thing seems like all strategic. It's a chess match, or as Mike says, it's a card game because they really, the defense really doesn't want a speedy trial. Trust me, they're not ready. They are absolutely not ready. And just a couple of days ago, they were stalling. Now all of a sudden, they're asking for a speedy trial when in fact they are not prepared to go to trial on October 2nd or even December 2nd. Dr. Debbie, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head, Sergeant Bill. It's strategy. It's, you know, not showing the cards, but showing compliance with the process. And we're in whether we're the defense team here, but we want to move forward steadily and steadfastly. But I don't think so. I'm not even sure that we will see an October 2nd date. We, we would hope to. Let's see also what happens, by the way, cameras in the courtroom. Will we see that or we won't see that? It would be interesting to hear what our viewers think, too. Would they like to see all of this, um, you know, day by day? It's it's controversial, right? Many of us in the field would like to because we like the idea of, um, you know, the analysis, the commentary, the review. Um, however, is it in favor of the defendant? Probably not, because sometimes the court of public opinion, you know, is, has a different viewpoint. But I do agree with you, Sergeant Bill. I think it's strategic. I think there will be continuances on this, and, and we may not even see it start uh, this calendar year. Absolutely. Uh, Mike, your thoughts? 
Uh, the the change in their approach to uh, when they want the trial just it's almost as if this caught them by surprise and now they're foundering and they're just looking now now they can't go forward quickly now they're looking to, to put it off I don't know that anything's coming out of those case files in discovery that's going to change their opinion about wanting to go to trial I think this was an excellent professional methodical investigation and the fact that there were no leaks from law enforcement until they had their man impressed me to no end. No, I think they did a fantastic job. And you know something? We look back on this case as I played the C.C. Moore uh, video on CNN from five months ago. I think, you know, and, and again, I'm not patting myself on the back. We predicted exactly what was going to happen in this case. And we went over all the investigative, investigative techniques that the police, the FBI, and the Idaho State Police would be would be doing. We even introduced new words to our audience surreptitiously. <laughs> <laughs> they all learned that word, you know, that collecting the DNA surreptitiously. Mm -hmm. But we, you know, geofencing, uh, video evidence, digital evidence, low cards principle of exchange. No one has heard that, and that really simply states when someone goes into a crime scene. They bring something of theirs into that crime scene and leave it there. And when they leave the crime scene, they take something of that crime scene with them. And that's called evidence exchange. It's exchanging evidence. And that's Locard's principle of exchange. Someone that stabs four human beings to death with a K-bar knife has definitely left evidence in that scene. Well, we already know he left DNA. But there's more. There is much more. And one of the things I bring up every single night, and we still don't know, the evidence recovered in the autopsies. One mm -hmm. of the most important things in a homicide investigation is the evidence recovered by the pathologist and the people assisting the autopsy. Some of the most important evidence, again, we always mention potential DNA underneath the fingernails from the victims potentially fighting back with the suspect. We don't know. That hasn't even been discussed. That could be like, you know, grand slam home run. It's over. The case is over. If his DNA is underneath the fingernails of any one of these victims, the case is over. And, you know, look, he's innocent to proven guilty. I will say that. And I get criticized all the time as being too cop-like and being too pro-prosecution. But that is my opinion. And again, the autopsy results have not come back, and I believe the prosecution has way more evidence than we've even seen uh, thus far. You guys going to sit there and not uh, <laughs> agree or disagree with me or what? I have to agree with you just because of the hectic nature and, and the violent nature of this crime. Just from what I know from investing, investigating murders and involving vicious stabbings of this nature. Uh he left some of himself there at the crime scene. And it wasn't just the DNA that came off of the snap of the night sheet. Does the prosecution at this point have any reason to put that out there in the public? No, absolutely they don't. They don't. And it, and it will be very methodical and careful as this evidence is now released to the defense. Legally, they'll get it when they're entitled to it, not before. Why put it out there in the public now? It's you're taking all the impact away. The trial is as far as we as far as we can predict, we think it's not happening for the at least in for the continuation of this year. I could see it ha happening maybe in the fall next year because I think there's going to be voluminous evidence that has to be sifted through by the defense before they even understand how bad their guy is under under the rock. And I think he's under a pretty heavy rock here. You know, Mike, when we were all not on the air before, you said something to me that I thought was very interesting. And I want you to repeat it because it's going to piss off our audience. But i that's part of doing this podcast <laughs> is to piss off our audience. And what I'm you familiar said is with that pissing people off. The, the public seems to think and the press seems to think that they have an absolute right to know everything that the prosecution has and that. It should be transparent. Go ahead, Mike. I just threw you the ball. 
Yeah, I don't uh, I don't remember ever reading that in the Constitution. Uh, <laughs> public's right to know. No, no, that's uh, that's a fiction of the media. Uh, and with respect to having dealt with the media extensively in my career, I don't ever think I ever went to them and told them the truth. I used them to put misinformation out there to get my suspect to do something that he probably didn't want to do to reveal more evidence. So with respect to what the public knew about this, the police did the absolute right thing and kept things on the wrap. This was a brilliant investigation, a very careful investigation. And if you weren't read in and part of the investigation, not only did or were you not entitled to know about it, they were very careful to make sure you didn't know about it. Because anything that got out to the media would have got out to this guy. And given his educational background, it could have damaged the case. So kudos to the detectives and the agents. Brilliant, brilliant investigation. Absolutely. Dr. Debbie, I know yes. we brought you we brought you into the weeds with us, but <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I can navigate through the weeds. Like All right. Well, go ahead. Go na navigate through the weeds. Answer that question. Yes, sir. Sergeant Bill, Detective Mike. So if I may just go back, uh, Sergeant Bill, to what you said, and I think it's an absolutely crucial point and, and statement you made about upon autopsy, what will be revealed there. There's no way that we're not going to have more substantial evidence from the suspect in some capacity within these uh, decedents. We already know there were defensive wounds and therefore, you know, they were trying very hard of, of saving their own lives and, and in so doing, there must be something and there will be. But, but now on this whole idea of, of the right for the public to know, I think a, a key, you know, indicator also we might think through is, is the when, you know, when do we have this right to know? We are living in this instantaneous society, right? I, depending on age groups, uh, you send a text and in 10 seconds or less, there's supposed to be a response. Well, it depends, you know, we just don't have that kind of uh time always to reply or respond quickly. But I think when it comes to these high profile crimes, we want it solved in the 48 hours or less. Okay. At times, maybe, but it's just not always realistic. And, and we know, and the viewers know that, that the level of complexity here of, of four decedents and this crime scene, and I absolutely agree with, with the kudos and, and, you know, the recognition and respect for, for the law enforcement uh, professionals directly involved in this, just to be, again, very mindful, very meticulous and, and following policy procedure protocol. But this right to know, I, I don't agree with, will know when it's the right time to know, when it's now heading toward trial. If it's to be televised, okay. And if it's not, okay. Either way, we will be within a, an educational framework. I think that's why, even as a professor, studying these cases becomes very educational, of course, for the public, but certainly we know that these suspects are also within a media mindset. So when I say that, I say that they too follow very closely media reporting in, in so many platforms, whether TV, digital, radio, they're following too. And I appreciated what Detective Mike said that sometimes you wanna throw them off because now you know they think that law enforcement is getting close and all of a sudden they know too much too about what's happening with an investigation. So I, I like to adhere in a always you know respectful uh, mindset about the timing in which this will happen. We'll know but there's no instantaneous need to know. Very well said, Dr. Debbie. You know, when the gag order was slapped on this case, at first I was like, oh, this is such an interesting case. Now we're not going to find out uh, in a timely fashion, except for what we've lear later learned to be leaks from a uh, person close to the investigation, which really sort of burns me because... Uh, that's a violation of a court order. And if that person was discovered, he or she should be arrested for that. And it's, you know, disseminating that information absolutely can hurt this case. And I didn't love when the judge slapped the gag order in the very beginning, but I realized it really was necessary. When you saw so many people being endangered by, you know, social media pointing fingers at them, you know, 
the boyfriend of Kaylee Gonzalez early on in this case, he was pointed out that he's the killer, you know, no, he's not, he's not, you know, but so you understand why the judge, uh, slap this uh, gag order on we could talk for another two hours guys but we've been almost an hour and 10 minutes i just want to say guys i uh detective mike besides being a uh, an outstanding uh nypd first grade detective he's also quite a writer and he these are his books burnt to a crisp uh the character in there is a detective patty durr it's actually semi-autobiographical of detective mike uh a reckoning in brooklyn I've read actually read all of these books. They're really outstanding and shot to pieces. All of these books are available on Amazon. So um, you go on Amazon, shot to pieces, A Reckoning in Brooklyn, and uh, Burnt to a Chris. Dr. Debbie, it's always an amazing pleasure. Uh, you, you, I, I'm a little jealous that you're in northern Miami right now because we still, we still haven't had the summer hit yet in New York. You know, it's been rainy and a little cool every day. But I know how the weather can change in Florida too. It can be beautiful. All of a sudden, you got a, you got a ten second tornado that right. wreaks, <laughs> wreaks havoc on the whole community, right? You're but right. Dr. Debbie, I'm going to give each of you your final thoughts, and then I'll, I'll let you guys go and get on with your lives. Dr. Debbie, you first. Your final thoughts? Yes, sir. Well, Sergeant Bill, as always, uh, Detective Mike, and although Detective Phil isn't with us this evening, but. I always appreciate the opportunity to, to come on the show and, and it's just so well done. And, and certainly the viewers are among the best and, and it's always great to um, be able to engage with them. I just think in this case, obviously we're, we're going to follow it very, um, you know, very closely and, and we want to be fair to both sides. We, we know that in our field and we don't want any policy procedure protocol to be violated. Um, but as we're speaking and, and what the discovery is that's now, we'll say, in the public's um, domain here, it's really, for me, pointing in, in a solid, strong manner as, as a prosecutorial, at the moment, um, win based on what we know, what we have. More will be forthcoming. I think we're all waiting for what this defense will be introducing as the uh, you know singular issue of, of how and what they're going to come up with here. But, um, but it is intriguing. And, and I always want to remember, if I may just state, and, and I think the viewers you know, understand and appreciate from where I'm coming, but the victimology on this is huge, meaning you know, we want to always be respectful of, mindful of these families. It's just beyond devastating. So for them, they want closure. And, and I think we want to just be mindful too. It's not just about this defendant, but the victims and the victimization that has occurred here is so far reaching. Thank you. There's the names, Dr. Debbie. And I'm glad you reminded me because sometimes we get talking about this case and we forget to mention the names of the uh, of the four students that lost their lives, Ethan Chapin, Zaina Canodal, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee uh, Gonsalves. And we never want to forget them nor their families, even when we do talk about the legalese and, and the, the evidence and everything else about this case. We don't ever want to forget that this case is first and foremost about them. Detective Mike. You know, Mike, I think you did a great job tonight, but you have so much competition. We got straight out of Brooklyn, Detective Phil Grimaldi. We got, <laughs> we got retired NYPD Sergeant Professor Law Degree, and I gave him another name recently, Father Mike Geary, because he reminds me of a priest, you know. And then we call, of course, we have Melanie Little that comes on all the time. But Mike, you're always welcome on the show, and I think you, you did a great job. Your final thoughts? Uh, I think Dr. Debbie uh, expressed it you know, better than I can. This is about the victims and, and the careful investigation and, and the lack of leaks are to the, to the detective's credit, but it's also, it's for the family. Uh, Vernon Gieberth uh, used to be the uh, commanding officer of uh, Bronx Homicide, and he wrote, pretty much the Bible of homicide investigation called practical homicide investigation. Vernon uh, 
used to say that we work for God and we speak for the dead. In my opinion, the investigators on this case and now the prosecution are composing themselves and comporting themselves in such a way that they do credit to the victims and we're not forgetting who they are. And this is going to be careful. It's going to be professional. And I'm interested to see how it transpires. But uh, right now, I'm a big fan of the Idaho police. The guys from Moscow, I think they did a fantastic job. And I want to say what an honor it is to share a panel with Dr. Debbie and you, Bill. I think I'm going to have to go back to school and get a couple of degrees. <laughs> That's for sure. That's for sure, Mike. Anyway, look, folks and uh, the audience, this is Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. I want to thank all of you guys for coming by, listening, supporting us. I'm 550 subscribers away from 50,000. So I, I have to hit that 50,000, guys. So give us the thumbs up. Ring that bell and make sure if you're not subscribed, go on our YouTube, hit that subscribe button. I hate to double dip tonight and, and hit, hit, hit that twice, but uh, we're, we're, just, we're just outside of 50,000. Again, Dr. Debbie from St. Thomas University, Detective Michael O'Keefe from the streets, the mean streets in New York, and the, the typewriter where he's busy writing books all the time. Thank you so much, guys. Everyone have a great night. Thank you. One episode, just saying enough.